appreciate the uh, presence of all that are joined in with this uh, class on the Book of Romans. Last week we finished up the second verse of chapter 8, Romans, and so we'll start uh, with uh, verse 3, chapter 8. Before we do, though, let's uh, start with a uh, short word of prayer. Would you bow me, please? <clears throat> And Father, as always, we come to Thee with our gratitude and thankfulness in our hearts for being allowed to live to this day that we can, with our brothers and sisters in Christ, join in the study of Thy Word and learn more of Thy will for us. We pray that bless this study and bless us in every effort that is uh, offered on behalf of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're thankful for his sacrifice and for his blood, that, that through that blood we have forgiveness of sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so it reads in uh, verse uh, 3, it says, For what the law, and when it says law, it's more likely referring to the law of Moses, but it has to do with any pure law system. So the law could not do uh, in that it was weak to the flesh. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Now a pure law system could not deliver the sinner from the condemnation of the law. A fleshly man could not keep that law perfectly, therefore the law condemned. That's what the law does. <clears throat> it could not deliver. That is the, the weakness of such a system. But Christ came as a man, the likeness of sinful flesh, didn't mean he was sinful, just in the likeness. He lived that sin, well, sinless life, and he shed his blood on the cross as a, per, a perfect sacrifice for sin. And he did all this on account of sin. Uh, that is because there was no other way to make expiation for man's sin. Man couldn't do it. So how did uh, Jesus condemn sin in the flesh? Well, since he came as a man, he was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin, Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verse 15. Thus Jesus, without uh, fail, did what was right under such temptation, and therefore condemned sin in the flesh. He showed that sin could be resisted, and therefore condemned those who did not resist. In Matthew, the 12th chapter, verse 41, we read that the men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented of the preaching of Jonah and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. The Ninevites and this generation are compared. The Ninevites did right under far less favorable circumstances than those being addressed by Jesus. This is condemnation on the principle that the one who resists sin in a certain case, case shows him to be wrong who commits sin when faced with the very same situation. This Jesus did show, uh, this Jesus did show the uh, world that it needed a savior. In verse 8, it goes on to say that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. The righteous requirement of the law required that sin be punished, but it couldn't do it. But this righteous requirement was satisfied by God sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh, who has made a sacrifice without blemish for the redemption of man. But the justification afforded by such sacrifice is available only 
to those who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, that is, the, the gospel of Christ, the sword of the Spirit. In verse 5, <clears throat> Paul writes, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. <clears throat> so those who live according to the flesh have a mindset to satisfy the fleshly desires and passions that lead to sin. They do not control their passions, but only seek to gratify them. Now those who live according to the Spirit have set their minds on the things of the Spirit, the, uh, the holy things that are set forth in the gospel. Such a one lives to please God and bends himself to that task. Having made the proper effort to do right, he is sorrowful when he fails. <clears throat> God in his mercy will forgive the failure so that the faithful soldier will be justified at last. In verse uh, 6, says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be carnally, carnally minded is to live according to the flesh. It is a life of perpetual sin. Such a one considers no other way to live. The result is always spiritual death. One who is spiritually minded lives according to the Spirit and gives heed to the things of the Spirit. Such a life results in eternal life and peace that is possessed only by the redeemed. In verse uh, 7, it reads, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. To be carnally minded, uh, that is, uh, tending to the flesh, is incompatible with the nature of God. They are enemies. There is no alternative to such a persistent condition except spiritual death, eternal separation from God. It is not possible for one tending to the flesh to be obedient to God. Obedience to the sinful desires and practices of the flesh must cease before there can be obedience to God. In Philippians, the third chapter, verses 18 and 19, there's an elaboration on the according to the flesh of verse 6 and carnally minded of verse 7 here. It says there, for many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. <clears throat> In verse 8, it says, so, <clears throat> so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Just having a body of flesh is uh, not here been addressed. Otherwise, just being born would be displeasing to God, so it must mean something else. Those who are in the flesh are those who are subservient to it and not to God. They are carnally minded and one that can serve, cannot serve the flesh uh, that is, continue in sin and please God at the same time. These are incompatible uh, attributes. In verse 9, <clears throat> But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. The phrase, not in the flesh, is being contrasted uh, with uh, the phrase being in the, being in the spirit not to be in the flesh is not to live according to it not to allow it to control us whereby we sin 
under pressure of its influence. To be in the flesh is to live as a sinner, whereas to be in the spirit is to live as a Christian. To be in the flesh is governed by it. To be in the spirit uh, is the spirit of man, that is, the inner man, man's will, that controls the flesh of man. If the spirit of man controls the flesh, which ultimately controls the spirit of man, uh, that should be, uh, you know, what is it that ultimately controls the spirit of man? If it's the flesh, it, it is the spirit of God, but only as the spirit of man through his will allows it. Accordingly, if the spirit of Christ does not control the spirit of man, the man cannot belong to God. <clears throat> The Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the uh, Holy Spirit are used interchangeably to mean the control that God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit exercise over the will of man uh, through man's obedience to the gospel, the word of God, the sword of the Spirit. Uh, there's no other way to do it. Verse 10, and if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. <clears throat> now, there's a lot of disagreement about what, uh, you know, it just out my confusion about what this verse means. And even among uh, commentators of the uh, church, there's disagreement as to what it means. As it uh, reads, the body is dead because of sin only if Christ is in you. Now, you have to ask, is the body dead because Christ is in us? Now, the physical body will die because of sin, sin of Adam, whether Christ is in you or not. You're going to die unless the Lord comes first. So it cannot mean that the body is dead by virtue of Christ being in you. Now the word if uh, can also be translated though or although. And if I uh, used here, if we substituted it, it would read though or although Christ is in you, your body will still die because of sin. The only sin causing physical death whether Christ is in you or not, is the sin of Adam, the effects of which plagues us to this day. That uh, notwithstanding, by living in the spirit, that is, the gospel of Christ, one is redeemed by the blood of Christ, that is, justified. Therefore, they have life eternal. It is said then that the spirit is life. In verse 11, <clears throat> but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. The him uh, is God the Father. The spirit is the Holy Spirit. It is the Father that raised Jesus from the dead. Therefore, if the Holy Spirit dwells in you, whether actually or representatively, that's another discussion, but however dwells in you, God the Father will give life to our mortal bodies in the resurrection. But will our mortal bodies be mortal in the sense that they are mortal presently? Uh, the verse does not say that we will be mortal in the resurrection. That we'll give is, uh, that's used there, that yeah, we'll give a life is future tense. But we're mortal now. So uh, verse does not say that we will be mortal in the resurrection, only that life will be given to our, to our mortal bodies. 
And we all know the verse uh, in uh, 1 John uh, 3, uh, verse 2, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we, be sh we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he, as he is. So we shall be mortal in the same sense that the resurrect, resurrected Lord is. Uh, it's a glorified body, and what that is, I don't know. Uh, I don't think anybody knows what it'll be like, but we do know it will be like him. So I have a quote here from the uh, Cambridge New Testament. If you, you may have that online. Uh, but the section, uh, chapter 8, uh, verses 1 through 11, yeah, that we just finished, it balances the preceding section, that's chapter 7, uh, verses 7 through 25. There, the inability of, of the law by itself to produce the higher spiritual life was shown. And the argument dealt primarily and mainly with human life as it is now. Here, the whole object is to show that the gospel provides just such a power as law lacks, that is, to revive and renew the human spirit so as to enable it to mold and master the whole life. The life and death spoken of are the spiritual life and death already described. The raising is the present liberation of the spirit, which affects the body also, making it to serve the true ends and live its true life. The raising of Jesus is proof, proof both of the will and character and power of that spirit which operated, operated then and operates now through the risen life communicated now to man. The future resurrection is not referred to, but it is, of course, implied as a consequence of the whole relation Thus described between God and man. Now, I wouldn't take everything that uh, this says as exactly what this verse is saying, but it gives you a, a different perspective on uh, what's been said, maybe a, a little elaboration on it. In verse 12, it says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Therefore, it says, therefore, we are under no obligation to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Now, this conclusion is derived from all that has been said before about the nature and effects of living according to the flesh or alternatively according to the spirit. It is implied that we are debtors to something. We are debtors to the Spirit to live according to it, which you have done faithfully, that leads to everlasting life and peace. In verse uh, 13, but if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. To be carnally minded, uh, you know, we read that in verse 6, to be carnally minded, minded is death. Now, to live according to the flesh, that is, to be carnally minded, will result in spiritual death. To live according to the flesh is to devote oneself to its sinful inclinations, which will result in actual sins. By putting to death the deeds of the body is to put an end to it. Uh, to have Bitchly practice them no longer. Of course, there are going to be occasional failures. Now, we've said this before, but if repented of, they will be forgiven. In verse 14, it says, For as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. So what does it mean to be led by the Spirit of God? Well, it's by every authorized means available to the Holy Spirit to lead men in the way of righteousness. 
It is by the gospel and whatever providential means that may be used to break down man's stubborn will in obeying the gospel. Of course, only Christians can be led by the Spirit of God, for the unbelieving will not. And these are the sons of God and will remain so, those that are led by the Spirit. In verse 15, <clears throat> For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, uh, Father. Now, Abba and Father are the same word. It, Abba is the Chaldean word for Father, so we could, we could translate it. We cry out, Father, Father. So bondage uh, means slavery. Now, before they re received the spirit of adoption, uh, that is, became Christians, they were in bondage to sin and therefore lived in fear. They, they did not receive at their baptism in Christ a fear of death and of the faith that awaited the, those who uh, were still in sin. So in the gladness of their heart, they could cry out in joy, Father. In Galatians, the fourth chapter, verses four through five, we read there, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. So we became sons by adoption. <clears throat> what we received by adoption was spiritual blessings that are only in Christ. In Ephesians, the first chapter, verse 3, a verse we know well, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So if the blessings are in Christ, how does one get into Christ? Galatians, the third chapter, verse 27, which we read before, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And we talked about uh, being baptized into Christ in chapter 6, so you may want to refer to that again just to refresh yourself. Uh, in verse, verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The Spirit bears witness along with our spirit that we are children of God and that by adoption, uh, not here contemplated as how to become a child of God, we are either living according to the Spirit or we are living according to the flesh. The Holy Spirit provides evidence to our spirit whether we are living according to the spirit or flesh. So there are two that bear witness as to the facts of the case. Uh, both the evidence provided by the Holy Spirit, that is, the gospel, and our own spirits when we consider our actions in light of that evidence, that is, the gospel. In verse 17, it reads there, and if children, adopted children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. If children, then it follows that we are heirs of God, children of the heirs, and joint heirs with Christ, since Christ is God's son which is a child, of course. So whatever inheritance awaits Christ as the Son of God also awaits us as the children of God adopted, perhaps not to the same extent or in the same capacity as Christ, but nevertheless, uh, there's a glory that awaits us. To realize this inheritance, we must uh, lead the life he led we must bear our own cross, 
it is not that we must suffer to the same extent that he did, uh, for we can't we can't do it. But if fidelity to him requires us to suffer, uh, great or small, then we must endure them as he did gladly, in order that the will of, of his father and our father be done. In doing so, we will be glorified as he was glorified. It is not that we want or seek suffering, but that we will suffer if joint heirs with Christ. As Paul said, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ will suffer persecution, 2 Timothy 3rd chapter verse 12. If one not, does not desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, they may still suffer persecution. Indeed, uh, suffering is a lot of mankind. Everyone suffers. But that one, uh, he's not going to be glorified in doing so. He's just going to suffer. That's it. <clears throat> in verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which uh, shall be revealed in us, and ASV has revealed uh, to usward. <clears throat> As indicated by Paul in his comment uh, to Timothy, life in this flesh is a time of suffering of one sort or the other. Only the grave will bring an end to suffering in the flesh, that is. As great as our sufferings in this life are, in whatever we may make of them, they are insignificant by comparison to the glory which shall be revealed to the faithful at the resurrection. Suffering is, is here, but for a moment, the glory is eternal. And of course, for those that are disobedient, suffering is also eternal. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, verse 17, it says, therefore, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verses two through four, it says, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent grown, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life, and that's uh, eternal life. In Romans, the fifth chapter, verses three through five, uh, Paul emphasized that the Christian should rejoice even in tribulation. The reads there, and not only that, but we also glory, glory in tribulations, knowing that the tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out to our, in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The apostles departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Acts 5th chapter verse 41. The apostle Peter said that, quote unquote, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. First, first Peter 4th chapter verse 16. In writing to Timothy, Paul told him, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. We just read that a moment ago. We should not let the likelihood of suffering for the cause of Christ cause us to draw back. As Paul said in 2 Timothy, the second chapter, verses 11 and 12, this is a faithful saying. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. 
If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. In verse 8 uh, and 18 that we read previously, the words shall be revealed, quote unquote, says that the quote unquote glory awaits a future time to be revealed. But it is the glory revealed, quote unquote, in us, quote unquote, or to us, word, as the A3 says, or for us, uh, that is, uh, for our benefit, uh, the word in, in the phrase in us, is from the Greek word ice. <clears throat> It is uh, most often translated into, but it is also translated to and for. <clears throat> so it's the translator's prerogative uh, which word to select. So are we the medium through which the glory is revealed, or is the glory revealed to us and for our benefit? We have no uh, complete information regarding the beauty and grandeur of the glory yet to be revealed in us, to us, or for us. As the Apostle John writes, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed we shall be like him, for we shall uh, see him as he is. Our as Peter wrote in, uh, as recorded in 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 7, the Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has, a, has begotten us again to a living hope <clears throat> through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that doesn't, does not fade away, reserved in heaven, for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so in verse 8, uh, 19, 8, 19, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. <clears throat> uh, some hold that this passage teaches that, that the creation awaits a time in which it will be revealed who are sons of God. Well, there's a problem with this. The uh, such view does not harmonize with the context. <clears throat> uh, Paul has already said that the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So we can presently know that we are sons of God or children of God. And as we'll cover later, the creation uh, is the church, and only the church can earnestly and eagerly expect the revelation, that is, the ultimate glory that awaits and belongs to the sons of God, that is, uh, the Christians. In verse 20, it says, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him, who subjected it in hope. <clears throat> the creation, uh, the church, is at present subject to suffering, not of its own will. <clears throat> the church, its individual members, has a, has a will, and its will was not to suffer. It wants to suffer. But it did suffer because of him, Jesus, who allowed it. Through suffering, the individual becomes stronger. 
it serves a purpose. Through suffering, opposition, persecution, the church becomes stronger. As has been noted before in Romans, the fifth chapter, verse three through five. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. And uh, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and so forth and so on. So uh, it does serve a good purpose. In 1 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, verses 10 through 13, Paul says, We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. To the present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and we are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless. And we labor, working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure. Being defamed, we entreat. We have been made the filth of the world, the offscouring of all things until now. And in 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, verse 8 through 10, Paul writes the following We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying a fat in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life of Christ also may be manifested in our body. <clears throat> Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica, uh, therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone. In St. Timothy, our brother and minister from God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith, that no one be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. That's in First Thessalonians, third uh, chapter, verses one through three. One through three. Neither the apostles uh, nor the church uh, then or now was exempt from suffering, persecution, opposition, and problems. So we uh, should uh, uh, glory in that. He goes on to say in verse 21, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. The Lord's church, uh, that is uh, the children of God, uh, shall be delivered from its present condition of suffering into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now this uh, glorious liberty is the liberty of glory. This glory is a glory with which Paul says it is not worthy to compare the sufferings of this present time. It is the children of God, Christians, who can have hope of sharing this ultimate glory of the children of God. In verse 22, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Now the start of this verse, of the, the, the for, that connects this verse to the preceding verse, or the things that are said preceding. Christians uh, are not the only ones subject to suffering. Uh, all humanity is subject to suffering. The whole creation, that is, uh, all mankind, all mankind, uh, that, you know, they're distinguished from just creation itself. Uh, of course, we said creation is just the, the church, that's the new creation. At the same time, the church is undergoing suffering. The whole creation, all of man, is also undergoing suffering. The hope of ultimate glory is assigned to the creation, the church, and not to the whole creation, all of mankind. In verse 23, not only that, 
but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. The uh, quote unquote, we and uh, we ourselves uh, is a group different from the creation uh, and the whole creation. If all refer to the same thing, then we have uh, a reference three times of suffering by the same group. That we are the ones, not the creation, or the whole creation, we have the first fruits of the Spirit. The we refers to the apostles. Even they are not exempt from suffering, as has been noted. Now, uh, I have some general thoughts on uh, this, but it's about five pages long. And I would never be able to get through it with the time remaining. So I think what I'll do is defer my general thoughts of this verse 23 until next week. And I must say that next week is very much dependent on what happens tomorrow. And uh, as it may, uh, uh, you know, it may affect my ability to, to talk. So we'll, we'll see what happens there. So we'll, we'll conclude now and appreciate your uh, kind attention.